Our next conversation for this second Widening the Pipeline virtual training really drills down on this issue of being the voice for the voiceless. Journalist Miriam Marini is a full-time staff reporter for the Detroit Free Press, but she also works part-time for Outlier Media. It's a Detroit-based service journalism organization. Outlier identifies, reports, and delivers information that empowers residents, people in issues like housing, food security, municipal government, and it holds elected official, officials accountable in ways that are um, unique and certainly innovative in today's information age. Miriam, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. And I know that we had our mini reunion with you and Gabby and others. So <laughs> we're spreading the NPF widening uh, message all over the world. But um, before we get started in your presentation, I want you to give the fellows a bit of a background on your uh, journalism career, how long you've been at the Freep, and, and tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, yeah. So I graduated from Wayne State University in May of 2020. So that was right as we were getting right into COVID. So I remember at the time I was interning for the Detroit Free Press. Um, it was supposed to be my last, <laughs> it was a Gabby's. It was supposed to be my last internship before I graduated. And I was like, you know what? This would be the crown jewel of my college career. I'll intern at the Detroit Free Press. It'll be great kickstart to whatever comes next. And then two months into my internship, I'll like, I'll never forget the day. It was March 11th. We were on spring break and we got the email that spring break was going to be extended. And two days later at the office, they decided that we were going to go remote for a little bit and we never went back. <laughs> so then at the time I, uh, I just kept going on as, um, as an intern and trying to finish out my last semester of school. And then once May hit, I was just kind of at a loss for what to do because it was the pandemic and I wasn't sure what to do next. And I just asked the free press. I was like, OK, you know, do you mind if I just stick with you as long as this COVID thing is going on? Like as long as this COVID thing's going on, like I'll leave once it's done. And so far it's still with us. <laughs> so I interned with them for about a year. Yeah, about a year. And then I was brought on full time January of 21. Um, and um, and yeah, and so I've been a breaking news uh, reporter with the Free Press since um, January of 21. And it's been a whirlwind. Honestly, it's been it's been just a series of rolling with punches. So um, a lot of my reporting focuses on well, I try to focus it on um, criminal justice, uh, socioeconomic issues. Um, equity, uh, equity uh, issues. Um, and I say try because I'm a breaking news reporter. So sometimes you just gotta go with whatever the day's news is. But when I have a chance to pursue other stuff, when I'm not putting out fires, <laughs> I try to go for stuff that focuses on um, equity and um, resources for residents and um, just kind of highlighting um, issues of accountability with lo uh, local government and sometimes some um, some criminal justice and some incarceration issues. Um, so tell us how you did the pivot from that to Outlier Media. How did Outlier come yeah. into play? So Outlier, they had a temporary fellowship. Um, okay, so Outlier has um, a text message service. And with the text message service, Detroit residents can text in and get information for resources that they need, including housing, food, um, home repairs, um, transportation, different types of uh, resources needed for like your day-to-day -day life. And the SMS service is in English and in Spanish. And through the temporary um, grant that they got, a Facebook grant, they wanted to do it for Arabic speaking residents as well. And once that uh, temporary fellowship was over, they needed someone else to step in and fill up, fill that role again. So then through their partnership with the Free Press, they uh, they were able to bring me on and I was able to help them um, kind of widen that 
option and kind of take it over for them. And so through that, I work for them uh, like less than part time a week. And I help them operate the SMS service, help them with um, some of their other features and uh, programs that they have that I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so that's how Outlier kind of came into the picture. As I think back on my own journalism training, one of the main messages that was just drilled into us every day was uh, to stay neutral, yeah. to keep arm's length, to yeah. not get too involved in the story. And so yeah. that's what actually fascinates me about the outlier media model. Yeah. It's because it seems to me that you're, you're asked to navigate this sort of wave between what could be perceived as advocacy Mm. versus just straight reporting. Yeah. So why don't you take us through with your presentation through the, the outlier model so that we can sort of understand how you juggle those two worlds. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Mm, let's present. Okay. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about outlier. So I've been with outlier since June of 21, since June of 21, I'm pretty sure. Um, and since then I have been helping them operate their SMS service, help them with their Detroit documenters program and also report on stories as they come my way. So a short, there we go. A short history on Outlier. It was founded in 2016 by Sarah Alvarez. And it was really founded as a way to close these gaps of information to help Detroiters thrive in their everyday life. So what Sarah was finding was that residents, especially lower income residents, were having issues fulfilling their most basic needs because they were either having trouble accessing the information that they needed, or they were having trouble connecting with the resources that would get them the most optimal results. So either they were encountering outdated information online or they weren't being pointed in the right direction. So this is where um, Outlier is meant to step in to help connect residents to resources that they need in order to just live their life. So things like um, whether you need rental assistance or if you need um, assistance with home repairs, that's a big issue in Detroit of people who um, are in these homes that are decades old and need these homes to be repaired just for the sake of upkeep. So um, one of the biggest um, one of the biggest foundational uh, principles for Outlier is being able to give actual practical information out to residents who need it rather than um, you know, rather than burdening them with these 2000 word stories of maybe they'll come away with some type of takeaway of how to actually live their lives to their fullest, it just gives them direct information as they need it. Um, so it really kind of, Outlier really is a service-based journalism and views journalism as, as a civic role in the community and making sure that we're filling that gap between government and residents in order to help residents to get the things that they need and to navigate these systems that are around them. Because sometimes it's just the way, even, even sometimes me as a journalist, when I'm trying to navigate these government websites or I'm trying to figure out, okay, what department do I go to for X, Y, and Z questions? Sometimes that takes me a while and I, research is my job. And so for someone who they're working two jobs or they have kids to take care of. They don't necessarily have the time to jump through these hoops to get the information that they just need to just live their lives. So it really centers the needs of the people rather than trying to capitalize off of people who are in these precarious situations in order to write stories or get clicks for headlines. So it really sort of steps in and fills that gap in terms of information and like how the last slide um, said that leaving these opportunity, leaving these gaps creates opportunities for misinformation and for people to fall into wrong um, avenues towards getting the things that they need. Um, oh, one of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, principles of outlier is giving more than we take. 
when approaching stories or when approaching residents through the SMS service, we're not looking at it in terms, like my first thought isn't, oh, how am I going to make this a story? It's what can I do to help this person to fix this problem that they're having? I'm not looking at this as this individual is homeless or this individual is having problems getting food on their table and saying this can be a story. My first thought is I need to get this person food. I need to get this person with a roof over their head. So it really shifts the perspective of I'm going to write this story. I'm going to talk to this and this person to I need to call this nonprofit, this organization, call the city to find out why this is happening and get the person what they need. So that's just one of the biggest, um, that's just one of the biggest foundations of Outlier is giving the people more than we're taking from them and not necessarily always looking at things in the perspective of this is going to get great clicks, this is going to be trending online, uh, this is going to sell X, Y, and Z papers. So just really shifting that perspective from the traditional mindset that we were taught in school. So one of Outlier's uh, main programs that they run is the SMS reporting. And so how it works is, and you can literally text it right now and see it for yourself on your phone. If you text Detroit to 67485, you will get this text message that's on the slide right now. It gives you a little bit of briefing about what Outlier is, and it tells you um, your options for what kind of thing that um, issue that you're facing. So like you'll see like text one for housing problems, utility bills, um, or you can literally choose to just get in touch with a reporter. So if you don't even wanna navigate this text message service and you just want answers directly, you just text and no reporter will follow back with you. And so this is something that every day we're checking in on. Every day we're texting with residents. And so you really get a sense of what are the needs of Detroiters firsthand rather than trying to assume for yourself or rather than trying to um, you know, go knock on doors or something. So this is really just a way to directly talk to them and figure out what do you need and how can I help you? So these are some examples of actual conversations that we've had with, um, with Detroiters. So for example, um, I remember Joey had this conversation with when he was doing some prison reporting and he um, was texting with a family during the pandemic that they were worried about the health safety of their loved one who was inside. And so he was able to, um, to get connected with the family, talk to a couple of people who were, behind, who were incarcerated in Michigan during that time. And it helped him to, I think he wrote in total, like probably two, three stories in collaboration with the free press. And it really focused on how COVID was running rampant through prisons in Michigan and how it was leaving an incredibly vulnerable population, just incredibly susceptible to the pandemic because to the virus, because they weren't taking the necessary precautions and they weren't prioritizing the health of, sorry, of these people who were literally at the state's mercy. So this is one example of a story that comes out of um, the SMS reporting. So this is a story that my colleague Aaron Mondry did on um, a, a scam that was that is running and very popular in Detroit of the concept of fake landlords. So he had a conversation through the SMS service with someone who had gotten an eviction letter, but they had been paying rent this whole time. So they had been paying rent, but for some reason they got an eviction letter at their home. And the more he dug into it, the more he was talking to people, he learned that this is actually a common practice in Detroit. And essentially what it boils down to is you rent a home and someone claiming to be the landlord or property manager comes to you, collects your rent. Meanwhile, they're not the correct person to be paying. And then months later, or however long they're able to keep it up for, you get an eviction notice and it turns out that you were paying the wrong person the entire time. So from this story that he did, and he focused on a woman named June Walker. And from this, and she had spent months making home repairs, thousands of dollars in paying for the house and also in upkeep. And it turned out that she was paying the wrong person the whole time. And she was set to be evicted from the home. And so from the story, the attorney general um, issued a consumer alert and an anonymous reader who read the story paid for her home and she was able to keep her house. 
this is another example of a story I did um, regarding flooding in Detroit. So during, uh, at the end of June of 21, there was, um, there was a really severe rainstorm in Detroit and a lot of homes were severely flooded, like feet of water in their homes. And um, we kept getting text messages of people who needed help with the flood. Months after the flood, they still needed help with either mucking out their basements or getting uh, getting money to replace appliances like their furnace or their water heater or their washers and dryers. And so this was months after the flooding and there were still people who were impacted by the flooding that hadn't gotten the assistance that they needed. And so through, and so we kept getting these text messages and I was like, okay, let me look into this and find out why this is happening. Like, why haven't people gotten their money from the city or gotten their money from insurance or anything like that? So as we dug into it, it had turned out that the city and the regional water system hadn't hadn't gone through any of the water claims that had happened um, that had come in during the flood months after it like still there were people whose claims were in limbo because they had get to get to these claims and it, the reason that they hadn't got to the claims is because they had an investigation going on that um that was looking into the cause of home flooding and the city told me that most likely all of the claims are going to be denied because the findings of the investigation, preliminary findings, had found that the cause of the flooding was just the amount of rain that came down and not necessarily a fault in the city's water system or the regional water system. So this is, I think it was like 40,000 claims that had come in from homeowners, insurance companies um, that were against the city and the regional water system that had yet to be that had yet to be even looked at because they were waiting on the findings of this investigation and the city had already said most likely that these claims are going to be denied and so these are tens of thousands of residents who are waiting on this money who are never going to get it and who are having to pay thousands of dollars out of their own pockets to recover from this flood that the city didn't take any responsibility for because you had aging infrastructure and just uh, an insane amount of rain. So through the reporting, we looked into FEMA claims. We looked into the hoops that residents had to jump through to get their claims even looked at from FEMA and how much money they even got. And we talked to the nonprofits that stepped up in the meantime in terms of uh, just kind of knocking on doors, helping where they could and the money that they were able to give to um to get these residents just back in their homes. Cause some people had water in their basements, they had mold in their basements. And we just looked into what's coming next because even tonight there's a forecast for thunderstorms and rain season is coming up. And so it's like um, one of the, one of the residents I spoke to was like, every time I see rain in the forecast, I just panic. Like, I don't know what to do. And the nonprofits that I spoke to, they estimated, I think, I think he had said like, it was like nearly a dozen families just abandoned their homes and moved out to apartments in the suburbs because they just, they couldn't afford to fix their homes. They couldn't afford to deal with the aftermath. And so it really kind of, this is another example of just kind of shifting that perspective of instead of talking to residents and just kind of chronicling like all of the things that they're facing right now, it shifted the perspective of, they're facing these problems, but why are they facing these problems? It's because the city has yet to look through these claims. The regional water system has yet to go through these claims and they're leaving these people to their own devices. Like it could have been like, it could have been like a feel good, heartwarming, oh, nonprofits are helping residents to, you know, get water heaters or get furnaces or replace their washers and dryers. But instead it shifted it to why is this happening? Why are why are these authorities who were in charge of this not stepping up, not giving the residents the money that they need in order to stay in the city? So that's one example. <laughs> so Detroit Documenters is another program that Outlier operates. And essentially, Detroit Documenters is a program that pays residents to attend public meetings and take notes on them. So you literally get paid, I think it's like $16 an hour to sit through public meetings and take notes on them. And those notes are then taken and edited by journalists and editors. And then they're published for public viewing. 
So through these notes, you can, there's like a database of notes of the last like um, two, three years of public meetings. And you can literally parse through and look at who said what during what meeting. And it's incredibly detailed in terms of the public comments and, um, and the resolutions that are voted on and the money that's spent. And it's this incredibly valuable database that we now have in Detroit. And it's, the program is also operated in Chicago and Cleveland. And so we have it here in Detroit, thankfully, and Outlier helps to manage it. And it's honestly just such an incredible resource. Like, I, I can't tell you enough how great it is. Like, even when I'm reporting on some stories and I'll want to get a resident voice, like if I'm reporting on some sort of program that's going on in the city or some type of um, city council meeting, I'm able to look through and say, okay, this resident said X, Y, and Z. Let me find this resident and talk to them about this. And then you're able to get residents included in your stories because you have this incredible program that is detailing who's stepping up for public comment, who's saying what. And it's honestly like, it's probably my favorite thing that Outlier does because it's just, I can't tell you how valuable it is. So this is an example of a story that came out of the documentaries program directly. And one of the, um, so in mid 2021, there was uh, the, the city ordinance, the emergency ordinance that had been put in place by the city's health director requiring public meetings to meet over Zoom was set to expire. And so a lot of people during public comments were worried about what this would mean. And so this was one of those things where you had residents who were concerned, who wanted to be able to participate, who wanted to be able to attend these meetings, but if it left Zoom, they might not have the ability to do that. Like they couldn't watch the meeting from anywhere. They would have to find transportation to meetings. They would have to find childcare. They would, it would just create this, this hardship on them in order to attend these meetings that they have a right to attend. So I decided to look into it and see exactly what this could mean in terms of if virtual meetings were to come to an end, what would that mean? And so what I found was virtual meetings were really a double-edged sword because on, in one aspect, it really helps in terms of accessibility and helping Detroiters who might not have the resources to make it to public meetings, they could make it from their living room, they could watch it while they're at work, they could participate from anywhere. So it really was great in terms of accessibility. But then at the same time, it was also kind of infringing on the aspect of public pressure. And so one of the things that I, I mentioned in my article was the difference between if you're on a Zoom and you're in a room by yourself, but you're on a Zoom, and let's say there are a dozen public commenters, that's, you know, you look at the number, it's 12, it's whatever. But if you're in a room and you're in a boardroom and you feel dozens of people around you and they're in line waiting to speak to you, the sense of public pressure is different when it's in person than when it is when you're on a computer and you can at the end of the day just slap it down and move on with your day. Rather than being in a boardroom and stuck with angry residents, it has a completely different sense to it. And another thing um, that was coming into play in Detroit, especially in Detroit, was the aspect of the mute function. So um, over Zoom, because you can mute, mute a speaker, this was coming into play during um, uh, particularly one of our uh, public bodies uh, had a habit of muting its members. And so if they, um, so they would have a secretary who would be running the meeting. And if the chair of the board said, okay, that's enough, the member would be silent. So that would be it. So if someone was saying something or speaking out of line, they would just be muted and that would be the end of it. Whereas in a public meeting in a, in person, even if you're muted, you can still, even if someone tells you to stop talking, you can just keep talking. Or like even during public comment, you reach your two minute limit. And on Zoom, they're instantly able to just hit a little mute button and you're done and you're over with. Whereas in person, you can keep screaming, you can walk away shouting, you can do anything. So it was really this double-edged sort of like, you want accessibility, you want people to be able to attend wherever you are. But at the same time, the the drama of being in person is just incredibly different when you compare the two. 
So that was one of the stories that I did that came out of the Detroit Documenters Program. And even if, so, if you visit the story online, you can see at the bottom, um, similar to how you would put a contributing line, I had a contributing line for the actual Detroit Documenters themselves. So these are residents who attended meetings and took notes, who are now kind of like published authors almost. So it was, it's a really great program, honestly. It's a great resource. And I can't say enough about how much it's come into play during my reporting. So Rachel wanted me to do some key takeaways of working with Outlier. And one of the main things that, so one of the main things that when I was reflecting on it and reflecting on how working with Outlier has impacted me through the, I think it's been over a year now since I've been with them, but through this time, it's just really shifted my perspective in terms of my reporting, even outside of Outlier. Like it really shifts my perspective in terms of how I'm viewing stories, how I pursue stories. Um, and just my, when I'm going into it, it completely changes my mindset. For example, um, from the SMS service, there was a woman who contacted uh, Sarah, who, so Sarah made contact with this woman who um, was having difficulty securing a ramp for her home. And so she was wheelchair bound and couldn't get a ramp attached to her house and she needed it in order to get to work. And so she had mentioned that she lived in a mobile home park and she, uh, her first proposal for a ramp, which was going to be paid and installed by a church. So it would have been free to her was declined by the property manager. So Sarah passed this along to me and one of the things that I wanted to focus on was how does the fact that she lives on a mobile home park impact her ability to get this ramp? Like compared to if she was living at her own house or if she was living in an apartment complex, how would that make a difference? Because we also have to remember how socioeconomic class comes into play when, when we're talking about mobile home parks, because now you're facing the, the issue of accessibility and um, independence, but you're also talking about financial um, financials and uh, socioeconomic class. And so it comes into play of how are these people able to have a self-actualized life? How are they able to express their independence if they have this, um, this control that's coming over them by property managers at, mo at, mo at the park? So when I, I went to go visit this lady, she lives in White Lake, Michigan. So it's about an hour outside of Detroit. And I went to go visit her and we spent the afternoon together and I was speaking to her. And as we were talking, I was really trying to figure out what has she done so far and what are her next steps? Like, what are, what are some of the, the, the approaches that she's tried to have and what is the, what's the next step? So her first plan had been rejected, but she had a second proposal for um, a ramp that was had yet to be approved or disapproved by the property manager. So, um, so after I visited her, I was really trying to research how did the fact that she lives in a mobile home park come into play and what are her options. So as I'm making connections with different um, different agencies around Michigan, like Disabilities Rights Michigan, the Fair Housing uh, Coalition um, in Southeast Michigan, um, they were passing along resources that she could contact. So as I'm researching, I'm also sending her resources. I'm sending, I'm saying, hey, you should contact this and this person. Hey, you should contact this and this person. And so as I'm doing my research, I'm also trying to help this lady get out of the situation, which when you think about it, isn't to my benefit in terms of when you're thinking about pursuing a story, because then what does the story become if she gets there? It essentially is nothing. So it's not to my benefit to connect her with these resources, but I'm still doing it because at the end of the day, that's, that's my priority is trying to get this lady a ramp and trying to get her to the steps that she wants to get to. So what ended up happening was the, the next week after I had went to visit her, she uh, ended up getting a ramp. She got it installed yesterday morning. And so for, it was great news. I was like, oh, this is great. This is amazing. She got the ramp. She's able to get back to work. Like, this is great. Because also another factor was her approved leave from work was set to expire by the end of the month. So it was this race to get the story done, but she ended up getting the ramp. So for me, I was like, oh, this is great. She got it. It's amazing. But like, 
a traditional mindset, if I was still in the mindset of when I was in school, I would be like, oh, shucks. Like, I'm not going to get this story. Like, I had this, like, amazing story imagined. Like, I wanted to feature these people. I wanted to, and, like, I was imagining the photography. I was like, this is going to be beautiful. This is going to be gorgeous. But then she got the ramp, and I was like, oh, this is even better. Like, this is even better than getting the stories, being able to get this lady the help that she needed. So that was just one example of the of the um of how outliers help to change my mindset is you're not necessarily trying to exploit these individuals and trying to sensationalize these stories and trying to make it into these like great things it's you're trying to help these people and you're trying to look at where is the system failing this person and how, why are they in this position and how can they be helped to get out of this position so it's it's really changed my perspective in that way of I'm not necessarily looking at someone's situation and thinking, oh, this is great. I am going to make an amazing story out of this. This is going to be amazing. I already know my lead. I already know what it's going to look like. It's more so just, why is this happening? Why is this person allowed to be in this position? Where has the system failed them? So, and honestly, it's really been so valuable to my reporting, even outside of outlier, even when I'm doing breaking news reporting is even when I'm reporting on these things, I'm I'm always sure to think about the context. I'm always thinking about how it's being framed of, this isn't an individual's problems. This is a failing of the system of if if someone, if, okay, so for example, a big, a big um, news story this week in Detroit was this man fell through a pedestrian bridge. So he was taking a walk and he literally fell through a pedestrian bridge. So instead of it being, oh my God, like, can you guys believe that this guy fell through a bridge? It's why, why was this bridge have like open for people to walk on when these studies and these <laughs> safe, safety analytics are saying that this bridge is in poor condition. And so um, reports also highlighted a study that was done by a university that looked at um, the conditions of bridges and it found that this bridge that he was walking on was in poor condition. So why was this man allowed to walk on the bridge? Not necessarily, oh my God, this guy fell through a bridge. Did he live? It's why was he allowed to walk on this bridge? So <laughs> just kind of shifting and just kind of making sure that you're not framing a story as an individual, but rather why is this allowed to happen? Um, another example that has come through the SMS service was um, there was a man who his car got towed and towing is a really <laughs> it's a really hot button topic in Detroit because it is riddled with corruption. <laughs> so um, he contacted us and said that he had an enormous balance at this towing lot that he couldn't afford to pay. He was between jobs and he couldn't get another job if he didn't have a car. So he can't pay this bill. So how is he supposed to get this car back? So instead of it turning the story into, instead of it being a story of this man's journey to get his car back, like what's he doing? It's more so of in a city that's riddled with corruption, with towing. Why are there no resources for residents? Why are there no city grants? Why are there no nonprofits who step in to, um, to pay for people's balances when they need to get back to work? It's highlighting why, why are, if, because we focus so much on the corruption in towing when we pursue these news stories of which city council member accepted a bribe <laughs> to allow this and this company to get more bids. It's looking at, well, what about the residents who are facing the consequences of a, of a predatory industry of thousands of people who are getting their cars towed every month why are there no resources for them to help get their cars back, to get them back to work, to help them get back to their lives? So that's still something that's in the works. So I'm working on it. <laughs> but that's another example of um, something that's come out of the SMS service and an example of how my perspective has really shifted since being with Outlier. Um, so another thing is the idea of collaboration. So Outlier has multiple editorial um, uh, multiple editorial uh, partners through the city of different outlets that we have monthly meetings with that we talk about what we're working on and what's to come. And so this helps Outlier to navigate, okay, who's covering what? And so we don't double on coverage. So we don't waste our resources covering, you know, X, Y, and Z story when this outlet's already, already got it covered. So it's, um, so it helps us to understand 
where are we best locating our resources? How can we best help each other? If you're working on this story, oh, I have a source that'll be great for you. Oh, if you're working on this story, this photographer would be great. So it's really a collaboration instead of a competition. Like it's never in a meeting where someone's working on something and you're like, oh no, you can't do that because I'm doing this. It's more so like you're doing that and here's how I can help you access this and this person. Here's how I can help you make the story even better. So that's also really shifting my perspective, especially as a breaking news reporter at a daily newspaper and always trying to be the first to get to something and always trying to race to the juiciest and newest. So that has really shifted my perspective in terms of you need to prioritize the lives of the readers. You don't need you don't need to prioritize the number of clicks. You need to, if they've got it covered, they've got it covered. I can focus on this. Like if they're covering you know, a story that has to do with prisons, I'm going to focus my resources to focus on food insecurity. So it it's really shifted my perspective on the news ecosystem and how we can change the future of journalism in terms of rather than being each other's competitions, we can be each other's, you know, supporters and we can do the best we can to do right by the residents rather than trying to capitalize off of each other and trying to get more eyes on our news site instead of their news site. So that's been a huge, huge takeaway that I've learned from being with Outlier. Um, another thing was accountability, like how I talked about was the framing of stories of it's not, if you see someone in a certain situation, I'm not trying to capitalize off of them and trying to write a story and being like, oh, this person's in this situation because of their personal failings. It's this person's in this situation because there are, there are gaps in the system that allowed them to get to this point. It's thinking about how, how the system allowed them to get to this point and trying to think of what, which, which, which city agency is is failing at its charter mandated role that allowed the resident to get to this point. So that was um, another takeaway that I had, that I've had from Outlier. I've genu- like genuinely, it's taken almost everything that I've learned from school and kind of flipped it on its head, to be honest. Like everything that I've learned in terms of traditional journalism and, you know, what I thought being a reporter would be kind of flipping it on its head and how Rachel said in the beginning of kind of blurring the line between being a neutral, being a neutral objective witness and trying to be someone who's trying to shift the situation and trying to help someone out of it and trying to close these gaps and help people to get the information that they need. Because I, I see it firsthand how hard it is to get access to the resources and trying to find the right people to talk to, find the right number to call to get this person the food that they need, to get them the housing that they need or the transportation that they need. So it's not easy. And it's especially not easy when you factor in the fact that these people's lives are so full outside of these needs. It can be even fuller if they were to get these needs met. So that's my spiel. (laughs) Such a spiel, let me tell you. Um, I have to say that had Outlier Media existed 40 years ago, 35 years ago, when I was really getting into uh, journalism, I I think I would have never gone anywhere else. I mean, this is exactly, it speaks so much to the heart of what I wanted to to accomplish as a journalist. And, And so my first, well, I take that back. I want to make sure that Amanda Goki, Amanda, are you there? Did your question get answered about the system? Um, I think I figured it out. I think the SMS thing, if I was understanding it correctly, is just the text messaging part of the job. But I, I wasn't just wanted clarification on that. So, well, so then what I want to put to you before I open it up to the group for for questions is. The issue of lived experience, Miriam, um, we talked about it in, in the session with Wendy, and we talked about how sometimes as journalists, if we care too much about these issues, uh, sometimes we're, we're branded as maybe being too close. Mm. Uh, it's too personal to us. It's something yeah. that you know we may have experienced in our, our lives. I gave the example of me writing about being a Head Start child uh, when I was covering welfare reform on in Washington. So what are your thoughts 
about how you're perceived as a journalist going into any community really, but certainly in the, the Arab community in Detroit yeah. or whatever, bringing back news, uh, getting resources to people who need them. Yeah. How do you deal with this issue of, of lived experience? Yeah, I mean, this is still something I'm trying to figure out as I navigate every day. Like even when I was visiting that woman out in White Lake who needed the wheelchair ramp, I was tearing up in her living room. Like I couldn't control it. It was, it was hard. I like I was trying not to, but it, as she's telling me her story, as she's telling me about how it's impacting her life, I couldn't not. And even so, even from the SMS service, sometimes I'm handing out my personal cell number. Sometimes these people are calling me every day and trying to say, "Hey, my kid needs food." So it's hard, it's hard to separate myself or to see myself as, oh, I'm just walking in as an objective witness to what is happening. It's no, I need to step in and I need to help. And for me, <laughs> like for me, it's it's really shifted my my perspective on my career as a whole. Of if this is something that's gonna jeopardize my career, I really don't care. Like this is for me, it's I'd rather help the person than get more clicks to the website and it, maybe don't repeat that to the free press. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me open that up then. Let's open up this question. Oh, wait, let me look in the chat and see what we have going on here. Does anyone have a question? Because I have 20. So let me turn to gallery view. Who, who does anyone have a question? Uh, Gabby, since you're. I have a question. Cool. Well, you know, mine is more so of a comment than a question, but as a fact checker, I am loving this outlier, what you guys do, um, because, you know, at PolitiFact, we look at it from a national point of view, and on top of that, we look at it as um, in a political view as well, who's saying what and um, what's accurate or inaccurate about it, and I feel like with you guys specifically um, at the Detroit local level, you're not only um, answering people's questions, but it's um, it's very hands-on, and I love that so much. So yeah, yeah. even right now, um, one of the projects that they're working on with the Detroit Documenters is so it's essentially Detroit Documenters just turns into a network of civic, like incredibly engaged residents. And one of the things that they're working on is a voter's guide right now. And one of the, and what's going to be interesting about it is they're approaching it as a job interview. They're approaching it as, okay, these are the qualifications that we're looking for. And here are the candidates that we have on the plate. And it's really, it's going to be really cool. I'm really interested. I'm really interested to see how it turns out. Like I'm very, I'm very excited. Your enthusiasm and your, your energy about this, Miriam, is infectious so to use a not a pleasant word, but it's, it's catching. Let's put it like that. But what I want to ask you is in today's media market and uh, the way things are, are, you know, we're coming down to like the five big ones, the LA Times, the Washington Post, the New York, they're the ones with all the resources. Organizations like yours are, are coming up to address, address certain needs, but is it enough to deal with one, the the distrust of media now, the the the, the feeling that anything connected to media is, is somewhat sometimes given the side eye, mm -hmm. uh, and then from the other perspective, uh, from the old guard in media, um, this is advocacy. This yeah. could be dismissed as just you just it's a step too far, and it's yeah. not journalism, so it could be dismissed. How do you deal with those two things? Yeah, I mean, it's it's something like every day that I'm in the office, I'm picking Sarah's brain. I'm like, I'm like, but how do you navigate this? How do you, how do you get how do you get people to trust you and to trust this? And I mean, trust me, the the SMS service, so we can open it up on our computers, right? There are tons of messages that are like, stop spamming me, get off of my phone. Like, it, you know, for every one message of someone who's genuinely interested and needs help, there are like four people who are like, I'm blocking this number, stop texting me. So, you know, so, so it is something that we're actively trying to navigate as we go through it. But I mean, it's one of those things that you just, and even this summer, one of the things that we were talking about was, 
getting feet on the ground engaged with residents because do you want them to know the name and you want them to trust you like showing up to block club parties showing up to you know concerts showing up to different events and meetings and making sure that people know our names and see the faces because that's one of the things too is you want people to understand that it's it's people behind this and it's people who genuinely care who want to stand next to you at you know the memorial day parade or whatever it is that you know, that we're here with you and we're just in the same boat. So it is something that I'm actively trying to navigate, even, even outside of Outlier, and even as a breaking news reporter, it's getting people to trust me. Sometimes I feel like being <laughs> a young Muslim woman plays to my advantage. Well, let's, let's think ahead 10 years. You know, one of the things that we're doing with uh, widening the pipeline is we're hoping we're instilling the ability to expand our vision of what's possible in journalism mm. for ourselves. Uh, mm. If maybe we want to be managers or we want to be editors or we want to be on the investigative team or yeah. the state house team, we want to give people that broad image. Yeah. And I wonder if for you, there, there could be the concern that even from a personal level that you'll enjoy helping people so much yeah. that yeah. You, you can't stay in the newsroom because you, you, you get more, actual tangible you know results yeah from you know like you say you if you have a great story and you're one one day away from getting it published and the person gets their ramp and your story yeah. is gone yeah so do you think that that's something that you you might wind up having to consider down yeah. the line yeah definitely i mean i i see management and to me right now it's incredibly unappealing and I know 10 years down the line, I'll be looking for security and something that's maybe slower paced than running around as a breaking news reporter. <laughs> but but it is, it's just something that's on my mind always. And I'm trying to figure that out as I go. And even, but I mean, even at Outlier and, you know, Sarah's in the SMS service and she's the founder. So, but I mean, it's a smaller team. And for me, I, I'm really trying to figure out what's the type of newsroom I want to go to thinking about the priorities and thinking about the goals of the newsroom. That's something that I hadn't thought of when I was graduating college of thinking about the newsroom itself and thinking about like, what is its, what is its mission? What is it looking to do for the readers? And if they're just looking to get eyes and get clicks, then is that something that I want to do? And I mean, definitely for me, in terms of my plan and my next steps I definitely want to look into you know investigative and longer form stories and really getting to the heart of that um but at the same time I just love being able to help people firsthand like I, I love it it's hard it's not easy but at the same time having that direct impact having someone text you and be like thank you so much like you even yesterday I called so when, when that woman called me to tell me that she got the ramp, I ended up calling her again to make sure that they put it in, to make sure that everything was all set. And she was choking up telling me about how, you know, the whole experience has been. And I told her, I'm like, even if I'm not directly the person who got your ramp installed, like, was I still of some help to you? Like, I want to know that I still helped you in some type of way. And she was like, yeah, like I was calling disability agencies all across the state and no one was giving me the time of day and you were the one person who sat down and talked to me and e even though I wasn't there with screwdrivers and drills and in, in this ramp installed sitting down and talking to someone and making sure that you're there walking them through it is so important like even um one of the, th when I was talking to Sarah about this, she was saying that even though we didn't get a story, it's still important to have a reporter there at the beginning of a problem so that we're there before it becomes a disaster, before it becomes a widespread issue and making sure that we're there if it does become that, because you don't want to be at the tail end of a disaster trying to figure out why it happened. You're there at the beginning and they're, you're there walking it through to make sure it doesn't become that. And um, so sorry this is another example that just crossed my mind but when it was um when it was foreclosure season back at the end of march in wayne county um we were we were having an address lookup 
So people could text in their address and we would uh, put it through and it would automatically put it through the system and tell them whether their house was up for foreclosure this year. And um, I connected with a senior, a senior citizen who wasn't sure if her house was, wasn't sure if, um, so I was able to find that for her, but she wasn't sure if her, if her, um, if her payment plan was intact because she hadn't heard from them, but she was still paying, but she just hadn't been getting much communication from the treasurer's office. So from, and, and at that point, it was like the week before the deadline and the treasurer's office was inundated with calls. Like I couldn't even get through. I was calling in. They were like, we're not taking calls at this time. That was it. And that was it. Like closed door. That was it. The only way to get to them was by scheduling an appointment and just getting your foot in the office's door. So I call her back. And at first I'm like, oh, like I haven't gotten this, like the answer. Like I haven't talked to someone. Like I'm like, I'm like, I'm embarrassed. But I was able to get her on the phone and I was like, you know what, the, the best thing we can do for you right now is to schedule an appointment for you right now. And so um, I was like, do you have access to a computer? Do you need me to walk you through it? And she was like, yeah, like I just need a little bit of help. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to open up my laptop and I'm going to schedule it for you. And so as I'm on the phone with her, I'm inputting her like personal information, <laughs> like literally scheduling her an appointment with the treasurer's office, but it saved her house from foreclosure. And it, it was just like hands on being able to help someone and make a direct impact on their lives. And to me, like, I feel like that'll always mean more to me than, oh, my story was number one trending today. Or, oh, I got the most clicks of any news story that was posted on the site today, which is something that Free Press does publish every day. Like they'll publish the stats of the day and you get to see whose story was most read. And for me, it's like, I get that, you know, there's value to that. But at the same time, to me, being able to help someone firsthand is so much more important than uh, kids. I have to tell you, the last time I was in the Charlotte Observer offices and they have a whole wall, in fact, two or three walls of um, apps and things that are tracking clicks and eyeballs yeah. on pages. Yeah. And, it, and it just, I was disgusted. I mean, it was just so far away from, from journal to me what journalism is about. But let me ask one of our investigative reporters really quickly. We're running out of time here and we could keep you all day. But um, Jen, this model of really sort of digging deep into these issues, but also providing people resources. Is this something that you is intriguing to you or, or tell me about in terms of the investigative work that you do? Are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Um, definitely, especially in my newsroom, we, you know, um, try to look at policy and how it affects people on the ground rather than chase after the sort of uh, political rat race. You know, this politician said this and is competing against this person. And um, we do, we try to focus on how those policies and affect people on the ground and how people on the ground are being left behind um, on some of these policies. Like um, one story I wrote a, a long time ago was um, about uh, a bill that was going through the legislature <clears throat> to give paid sick leave to people in Nevada, but it only gave paid sick leave to businesses with more than 50 employees. So it was leaving out huge amounts of people and contract employees. Um, so I wrote a story uh, focusing on, on sort of the lobbying effort by some of these immigrants that wanted to expand this bill because they were at the end of the day being left out, even though Democrats got the headline, you know, Nevada gets paid sick leave. Um, you know, the most marginalized communities, contract workers and, and immigrant workers were um, you working in these like smaller uh, companies were getting completely left out. Um, so I, I do think that. You think they can co coexist? I think they can coexist. And, and it's important to focus on how these policies affect people to get a deeper, more interesting story that more people want to read. That story got a lot of reads and did really well because so many people saw themselves left out of this policy discussion. Um, so I think it's it's valuable um, work to go into the nitty gritty of, of, 
of how people are affected day to, in and day out by the government's choices. I agree, absolutely. We have time for one last quick question, if there is one. Um, I don't see any hands risen. So <clears throat> what I would like to, to ask is um, for Miriam to sort of sum it up for us. Is this the, the future for us in terms of particularly as people, men and women of color, as people who are uh, not only representing various communities, but also, again, back to that lived experience, we bring this to the table, to the editor's rooms, to the news meetings. If we rise up the ranks, we're the ones making the decisions about the investigative stories that will be covered or won't be covered. So how would you, would you recommend one of the fellows following in your footsteps? I think so. Yeah, I think there's definitely value to to interacting person with residents, to making sure that they are getting value from from their news agencies, that you're giving more than you're taking. That's one of the foundational principles for outliers, making sure that you're not capitalizing off of residents more than they're benefiting from you and making sure that we're keeping their needs at the center of our reporting and making sure that everybody's getting what they need to get to live their full lives. So I definitely think there's a future in this. And I definitely think it's something of value to keep in mind as we rise in the ranks because residents and centering them in our, in our coverage is something that'll always, that'll never hurt you. It'll always be a benefit in terms of trust and in terms of building loyal readers who actually care about the future of your agency and and, and are loyal readers. Well, um, of all the powerful things that you've said this afternoon, a couple of things spring to mind, and that is the need to give back more than we take. Yeah. And so often in journalism, you're absolutely right. We're so bent on getting the best story, being first, uh, maybe being submitted for that prize or, or just looking like we're the best at what we do. Mm -hmm. and, and this conversation has really brought me back to, to that space. The second thing I want to share with you is that I know, I sense that one day you'll be leading perhaps an organization similar to Outlier. So I hope, I want you to make me a promise if I'm not too old, hire me. <laughs> I want to work for you. So thank you so much for taking time out and for your wonderful sure. presentation. So and fun. let's all give Miriam a virtual round of applause here today. Uh, I, we so appreciate it. And we, we will be calling on you in the future and thank hope you. we can get you to, to join us at some point. Thank you. Thank you. And I have my email. I'll put my email in the chat. So well, you know, we we put your email on the, the program, so we're oh, good. Perfect. We'll be oh, perfect. Miriam, you already know I'm going to hit you up. <laughs> <laughs> so you take care, and thank you so much. Bye. This was so bye -bye. fun. Good to see you.